In the name of the glorious Trinity, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, forever. Amen. Glory be to the everlasting mercies which sent you to us, O Christ, the light of the world and the life of all. Give us wisdom by your law and enlighten our impulses by your knowledge. Sanctify our souls by your truth and grant that we may be obedient to your words and may fulfill your commandments at every hour. O you who enlightens the rational with the knowledge of your greatness, do enlighten, O my Lord, our thoughts, that we may meditate upon your holy and divine scriptures at all times, O Lord of all, Father and Son and Holy Spirit forever. Amen. The greatest commandment that Jesus has given us is the commandment of love. A new commandment I give you is that you love one another. Love. Today, love has many colors. Um, I'm sorry to say, uh, from pornographic to fake, being fake. When we hear the word love, we immediately you know, consider charity, which is great. We consider helping one another, I mean, that's great. The love between a, a boyfriend and a girlfriend. When uh, a boy and a girl are going steady, um, the girl must uh, prove her love by giving the boy everything. And you know what I'm talking about and vice versa. And when you love someone, you need to have a sexual relationship with that person. And by the way, let me tell you something. Just because you love someone and you have a sexual relationship outside of marriage, that is still fornication. Love doesn't bind a husband and wife. No, the church binds the husband and wife through the prayers and the holy matrimony. So the kind of love that Jesus has commanded us to, to show one another, the pure and genuine love is defined in the epistle of love of St. Paul, the apostle, 1 Corinthians 13. Although I always say the love, the 1 Corinthians 13 love. We're going to have a look at that, but I'm going to just take, I'm going to only take one characteristic of love that Paul is talking about, and that is patient. The love that Jesus has commanded us to share with each other is a patient and sweet, pleasant, kind love. Not a love that involves giving. Not a love that, that has to be proven by giving. No. Patient, sweet, pleasant and kind love. We talked about patience in the last episode. Another word used for patience is long-suffering. When a mother is being patient with her child because the child is involved in drugs and is in and out of jail and is, um, you know, always having a brush with the law and crime, what have you, the mother is suffering. That means she's being patient, but patient also entails long-suffering, which is what St. John Chrysostom puts it as the root of all all self-denial. So love that is self-denial, sweet, pleasant, and kind is what we need to portray one another. That is what we need to possess. Be it in marriage, in relationships, in families, in friends, in relatives, and what have you. And our neighbor. Let's not forget, Jesus gave us a parable, the Good Samaritan, who is my neighbor? Anyone who is in need. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29 claims a man that is long-suffering, that is patient, is of great understanding. But that, or he, who is hasty of spirit, is mightily foolish. Proverbs 13, verse 32, He that is patient is better than a mighty man, and he that subdues himself than he that seizes a city. 
St. John Chrysostom writes on long-suffering or patience that they are unbeatable weapons and are sort of impenetrable towers, easily beating off all annoyances. Jesus Christ, we saw this in Jesus Christ. The scorning, the ridicule, the refusal, the rejection, the resistance, the evil that was wrought on him, yet he was not penetrated at all. Why? Because he was patient and he was long-suffering. You may say, yeah, Ravi, you're talking about God incarnate. We're not. Yes, I am talking about God incarnate. I'm, but we too, we too have been promised by God incarnate that if we suffer with him, we will reign with him. Suffering means long-suffering, being patient, beloved. This is the quality of love that we need to possess. This is the love that we need to possess. And this is the love that St. Paul talks about in Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 Corinthians chapter 13. St. John Chrysostom goes on to say, and as a spark falling into the deep does no injury. Now, when a spark falls in a deep, nothing happens. But it itself easily is quenched. The spark just goes out. So upon a long-suffering soul, whatever unexpected thing falls, this soul indeed speedily vanishes, or the unexpected things vanish. But the soul is disturbed not. Nothing happens to the soul. The person is not, is not moved at all. For truly there is nothing so impenetrable as long suffering when you're patient whatever comes upon you and and you know again the, the quality of patience that jesus possessed not what the world portrays you know i'll give you once twice third time you know but you know what is it um beat me once um fool me once and fool me twice no 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 not not what uh, uh what is it george bush claim. no no being patient constantly being patient long suffering for someone Anything that comes upon us, St. John Chrysostom is teaching us that they won't affect us. Maybe for a short period of time, but we learn to overcome, and just as Jesus did. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord God does not delay his promises. See, there's the promise, as people consider delay. But he is patient for your sake. Think about it, beloved brother and sister. In one day, no, 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 not even in a day, in an hour, in a period of one hour, how many times do we grieve the Holy Spirit of God? How many times? And yet do we see fire and brimstone come down on us? No. How many times have we, have we sinned to the point where we are ashamed to face our Lord? But we still hear the voice of God telling us to come. I'm patient with you. Come. Repent. I will receive you one more time. Repent and sin no more. So the Lord God does not delay his promises as people consider delay, but he is patient for your sake, even when we grieve his Holy Spirit. And because he is not willing that any person would perish, but that every person would come to conversion, that is repentance. That, is, that should drive us to long suffering, that the person that is in wrong, is in error, is in evil, is in sin, that we must be long, uh, uh, patient and long suffering so that that person is converted, comes to repentance. And sometimes the best thing you do during being patient is to pray and to fast for that situation, for that circumstance, or for that person. That is why our love should be long-suffering for the sake of the repentance or eventually a new life in Jesus Christ for others and ultimately salvation for eternal condemnation. Beloved, if a person is living in sin, we say in the prayers of the liturgy of... Um, the burial of the dead, that the judge will not forgive the soul that has not repented. We say this, we sing this. And I must preach this. I must not sing this and say it and then get on the pulpit and say, well, no, God is merciful, he'll forgive everyone. Yes, yes, right now, he is patient with us as long as we are living on this earth. But when the Lord returns, when the heavenly bridegroom returns and the, and the five or the ten or was it the five foolish virgins didn't have oil, what did Jesus say? What did the bridegroom say? I do not know you. They knocked on that door of the banquet and said, have mercy on us. Let us see. And he said, I do not know you. 
So that is why we must be long suffering for all for the the friend, the brother, the best friend, my girlfriend, my husband, my wife, whoever it is, my neighbor. Because if they continue to live and die unrepented in sin, they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no salvation. So let's be patient with those, long-suffering for those that are in error so that we can bring them to the knowledge of the truth, new life with Jesus Christ, and as I said, ultimately salvation from eternal condemnation. St. John Chrysostom continues to write, you may talk of armies, money, horses, walls, arms, or anything else whatsoever, you will name nothing like long-suffering. It is the greatest charity. It is the greatest gift, the greatest help, assistance that you can give a person who is in error, who has wronged you, whatever, that you must be long-suffering and being patient with that person. That is the type of... When you say to someone, I love you, meaning whatever it takes from me, I am prepared to give to continue to remain with this love that I have for you. You know, many people say to me, um, so Father, when someone is called, a call, uh, sorry, someone is caught in adultery, so, you know, definitely divorce is warranted, right? The husband or the wife, yeah, they have the rights to. I say, yeah, of course they do, according to the Holy Scriptures, of course. But hey, how many times, how many times do we commit spiritual adultery how many times do we worship that which is not God? How many times do we give more love for our social media, our, our um, image, right, than love for Jesus Christ? How many times? That's, that's spiritual adultery, but Jesus keeps taking us back. So the husband can be long-suffering and be patient so that he can save that relationship that marriage because not only because of the children god will take care of the children oh children suffer more in broken marriages yes they do but god will take care of those children you know who suffers those who are in error those who are who go through divorces because of lack of self confidence i'm sorry lack of patience and lack of long suffering the patient the long-suffering, the sweet, the pleasant, the kind love that we possess is a weapon that truly will heap coal upon the heads of our enemies. Now, some people say, yeah, that's great. You know, I'm, I'll show love for someone so I can see that person burning with the coals. Well, that's wickedness. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what Jesus or St. Paul is instructing us. No, not wickedness, beloved, but rather as Oregon of Alexandria writes, for the benefit of of our enemy. He writes, for it may be that a savage and barbarous mind, if it, the mind, feels our goodwill, our kindness, our love, and our godliness, may be struck by it and repent. And he will swear that as his conscience torments him for the wrong which he has done, it is as if, if a fire were enveloping or persisting him so we can put people we can encourage people we can instill the fire and the zeal and the desire in those people whom we show patience and love that they may come back to repentance and to reconciliation with us if we are uh, you know not at odds with one another if they are doing us wrong so patience is the weapon to heap these coal. Because what did St. Paul say? Love your enemies, feed them. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them to drink. By doing this, you are heaping burning coal. So that means by doing this, you may change that person's character from evil to repentance. That is what Romans 12, 14 alludes to, beloved. The patience, the long-suffering that are greater than the armies. St. John Chrysostom writes, greater than armies and money and horses and walls and arms and anything and fame and glamour, patience is greater. For he that encompasses armies, money, horses, walls, arms, oftentimes being overcome by anger, is upset like a worthless child and fills all with confusion and commotion because there is no patience. But the man, beloved, that possesses long-suffering, 
settled as it were in a harbour, enjoys a profound, sincere calm. Wow, what a what an attribute that it sounds beautiful. I mean, when you read these commentaries of the fathers, you know, it, it, it instills in you a desire that yeah, I, you know, I want to be, I want to be patient, but yet, beloved. Patient comes, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, after faith, knowledge, virtue, and self-control comes patience. You can't just possess patience without believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot possess patience, a love that is characterized by patience, without looking at Jesus Christ, beloved. And that's what Hebrews says in chapter 12, verse 2. And let us gaze at Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was his, the joy that was his, what joy, beloved? Resurrection, eternal life for you and I. He endured the cross and ignored the shame, and he sits upon the right side of the throne of God. Did you hear that, beloved? He endured the cross. He ignored the shame. He took the shame as though it didn't even happen to him. Look at the love. This is grace. What we were talking about last week, grace. This is the grace of God. He took our shame, but he took it as though it didn't even happen to him. He ignored it. And he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. And that, my dear beloved brother and sister in Christ, is a promise for you and I. So I want your undivided attention now. Listen, stop the washing and the, and the vacuuming and pull to one side. This promise is for you and I. Look at what St. Paul writes to Timothy in his second epistle, chapter 2, verse 12. If we suffer, if we possess the patient, sweet, kind, long-suffering love that Jesus possessed, if we suffer with him, for one another, suffer because for him, suffer because of him, for him, and for one another, we shall also reign with Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Let me read it again. If we suffer, so you're suffering now, stop whinging. Stop whinging. Oof and arm and oh, why? Why is it like this and why is it like that? If he's a loving God, why is there so much evil? Because there's human beings that are living on this world, on this earth, beloved. Human beings, man, commits crimes. Not everything is God's fault. So get over it. God is in full control. God knows. But God has given that gift for you and I, which is free will, the gift of free will, the gracious gift of free will, and we use it evilly. We use it in a way that is not pleasing and appeasing to God. We use it as, as you know, as though I know how to use it. It's mine. I'll use it as I want. Mine and no one can tell me what to do. Nothing is yours. All we possess, beloved, is that six feet grave that is awaiting everyone. That's what we possess. So let's get over this whinging about suffering. There will be suffering. Christ didn't come and sugarcoat Christianity. Listen, Christ hasn't promised you that you're going to be a very lovey-dovey life on earth. No, Christ has actually said you're going to suffer. So you want to believe? You want to continue to believe in Jesus Christ and love Jesus Christ? You must be glorifying God, jumping for joy as the disciples did because you are suffering for Jesus Christ. And know that when you suffer for Jesus Christ, you're hammering Satan. Satan is at your feet and you are overpowering and you are totally destructing Satan. So if we suffer, if we continue in long suffering, we shall also reign with him where? Where? In Disneyland? No, in Europe? No, the Aust Austrian Alps? No, no, no. In the kingdom of heaven, the eternal kingdom, beloved, of God, the kingdom of heaven. But if we renounce him, you want to let go of Christ because um, life's a little bit unbearable? Well, he will also renounce you. Because you are disobedient. If we renounce Jesus Christ because 
we're having issues of health and relationships and, and, and finances, whatever it is, well, he will renounce that eternal kingdom from us as well. So let's continue in long suffering. Let us suffer for our faith, for our Lord Jesus Christ, with our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us suffer for one another, beloved. Be patient with one another. Next time someone says to you, I love you, you reply and say, is it the love that is long-suffering and sweet and kind or is it a lip service love or a cliche love? Is it one of those I loved you first and most and loved you more and what have you, right? No, no, no. Next time someone proclaims that he or she loves you, examine that love. Next time you want to express love for someone, you first examine your love before you give it to someone else. Is it long-suffering? Is it patient? Is it kind? Is it sweet? Because, beloved, this is the love of God. Every day, every second of our lives, God is being patient with us. His love is sweet. His love is kind. And he does not desire the death, death of a sinner, but that he shall repent from his evil and live. Praise and glory be to Christ our Lord, now and at all times and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this week's message. Please don't forget to rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends and family. For any future topic suggestions or to give us detailed feedback, please visit our link in the show notes, linktr.ee forward slash double-edged sword. Until next time, God bless you all.